Hi, my name is Jan Jungman. I'm developer evangelist at Arm. My name is Johan Stocking, I'm CTO of the Things Industries. And today we're demonstrating a multicast firmware update for LoRaWAN. I'm just going to start it, uh, and in the meantime, we're going to tell what it is and how it works. Uh, just to begin with, we have an update application. We have nine devices here, and we can select which devices we are going to update. So I'm going to update these devices, and here I can select which uh, firmware we're going to update. So we're going to update the the full device firmware. So that exactly. is that is in this case about 52 kilobytes. So I'm going to update the rainbow. And now the network is going to select the devices. So Jan, tell something about the devices. So the devices that we spun up are uh, a dual MCU design. So there's a, an MCU from NXP, which runs the base application and all the crypto. And then we have an external LoRa radio, which is designed by Multitech, which is the XDOT, which is designed on a board that we customly made for this demo. Uh, it's commercially available from LTech. Details are on the Embed website. It's called the uh, LTech FF LoRa available right now. Uh, in the future, we want to uh, bring this on a single MCU design. What happens in the meantime here is that the devices that I selected for update uh, are joining a so-called multicast group. And a multicast group is where is a temporary session where uh, LoRaWAN devices, just any LoRaWAN 1.0 device, uh, share the same session keys. And these devices, uh, which are part of uh, the update group, uh, are going to share the same session keys. And these instructions are sent by the network server, and the instruction contains uh, timing information, when to open a Class C window. And in a few seconds' time, you will see that these devices switch to Class C. And Class C and LoRaWAN is an active receiving mode uh, in which they can receive packets. Um, so those instructions are sent over normal LoRaWAN class A downlink messages. So while the device is normally transmitting, and this might be over the course of a week, if you're talking about devices that only transmit once a week, once a, once a day, we're instructing devices and we're telling them, you need to wake up in continuous listening mode in six days to 23 hours. You need to use this frequency. You need to use these session keys, etc. Uh, and this way we're preparing all these devices to go to listening mode at exactly the same time. And it's the only viable way to do firmware updates over LoRaWAN. Because uh, this way the device don't have to transmit, so it means it's a lot less power than being used when the firmware is transmitted, but four, four times as little. And we don't congest the network that much, because the gateway can treat all these devices as a single device. It only needs to transmit it once. Yeah. In, uh, in practical use cases, um, probably it's going to be planned in a few days or a few weeks' time uh, when, a, when a group of devices will be updated. Uh, you can do this as a network over your existing network, uh, existing gateways, where you uh, select multiple gateways that are part of the multicast, so you spread the loads uh, of the gateways uh, over multiple gateways, uh, or you can have dedicated update gateways that you, that you use uh, to update devices. But anyway, it's cheaper and easier uh, than climbing into poles. Um, what you see here in the meantime is the update progress. Uh, so the devices that are part of the podcast uh, are showing the progress of uh, the packets that have been received. Uh, and there is also, as you can see here, red lights, there is also packet loss. And uh, packet loss is inevitable with a LoRa one. Uh, and the, the protocol, the algorithm that we're using, uh, accounts for packet loss because of forward error correction. So first we send the image in fragments just as is, and then we start sending redundant packets, and they can be used to recover uh, from lost packets. So one of the one of the risks that you have when you're uh, doing firmware updates is that a firmware update capability is a very big attack factor for hackers, crackers, etc. Uh, so we took, we've taken a number of precautions in this. So all the devices are sharing the same session keys. So theoretically, an attacker can grab the memory of one of these devices, extract the session keys, and then start sending additional packets that are not part of the official framework, of the official firmware, trying to inject stuff into the firmware. Uh, so to mitigate that, our first line of defense is that after the full firmware is reconstructed by the device, it hashes the 
creates a hash of the device and that sends a vector network over its normal lower rank plus A credentials. Uh, then the network can verify if the binary that we received on the device side is actually valid. So that's nice, but we need to take additional precautions because what if you send a firmware update to a device that's actually not meant for it, could break the device. Um, so what we do is every device holds a public key of an X509 certificate, and the private key of that X509 certificate is they use to sign the firmware. So this way, whenever we fully reconstruct the firmware, we verify that it was meant for us, and we verify that it came from a trusted source. We can then verify whether it was actually signed by a party that we trust, and whether it was actually meant for us, because the device uh, manufacturer ID and the device class ID are part of that update. Uh, and that way, we, uh, we offer a, a proper security uh, security story. So the devices are almost done updating. You see uh, uh, very little packet loss. Uh, uh, the, all the parts here are green. Uh, the devices receive everything. You see here, the, this device already received. This is currently updating, doing the cryptographic verification. And this is the firmware that we're updating. So you see now these devices, they are all uh, being updated. So this is really the firmware that we updated. And Jan will show that it's actual firmware updated by power cycling the device. Uh, it will still run this. Uh, rainbow uh, firmware that we uh, that we send as an update. So the next steps are that um, this needs to be uh, standardized. Uh, and so the um, uh, protocol to set up a multicast group uh, to set up the fragmentation session, those will be standardized. Uh, algorithms uh, for forward error correction, uh, they will not be part of Aura 1 specification probably, uh, but there, there are best practices to do this. And also for uh, cryptographic verification on the end device, uh, you can use industry standards such as uh, technology that ARM uh, provides. Yeah. So, the bootloader and the cryptographic verification that we use in here is not something we developed specifically for this demo. It's it's something that ARM is already providing in our commercial cloud offerings. So, it's something that's proven, it's something that we know is correct, and we know it's something that works uh, in the field. Also, because the bootloader is built on top of Android OS 5, our, uh, our platform operating system for ARM, it means that the bootloader theoretically runs on 120 different targets already. So in the, in the near future, we'll be working with, with a number of our MN partners to port the bootloader to their silicon, and that way we can run a full update on any of our targets, uh, regardless of what your loader radio is. All right, well, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks to Semtech and thanks to Multitech uh, for hosting the demonstration at the Laura Alliance uh, All Members Meeting, where we are now in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thanks.